Well, before we go too far, I do need to say that I may have been better suited to teach last week's content. And my primary evidence for this is found in what my teenage kids like to refer to as one of my catchphrases. It's pretty special, actually, to have leveled up in parenting to the point that somewhat frequently I get slow roasted by the young human beings that I have kept alive and showered with all of my affection for years. And no, I'm not bitter. It's actually pretty fun. Here's the deal. I am a moderately risk-averse person. I like things to go and to operate and to stay how I like them. And some people might call that controlling. I prefer to think of it, I prefer to think of it as being wise and experienced because there is, after all, a right way to do most things. And what this means is that invariably, when someone is loading the dishwasher inefficiently, or if they are picking something up with one hand, it's very fragile, they're not even looking at it, or perhaps they are pouring their beverage next to a computer. My computer, in fact. These are all things that have actually happened. I have been known to say, no, no, please don't. And this line is partly responsible for why I am referred to as Team No around the house. And I would go so far as to suggest that every house has such a person, regardless of whether it's friends or partners or roommates living together. And to my Team No friends, I say, stay strong. (laughs) Okay, I only mention this as a way of admitting that I don't always come naturally to the plucky, optimistic, imaginative work that this time of year inspires. I am a stay-the-course kind of person. I like keeping things simple. I'm more comfortable talking about letting go and letting slide and letting it pass. And if you know me well, you know I'm not super likely to be accused of picking up too much or picking up too soon. Which means that this series has something for me this week. Maybe it has something for some of us here. Even if we don't feel like we're suited or even ready to consider what newness we should be open to. And as a pastoral team, we actually trusted that this would be true when we planned this series months ago for this new year moment of transition and adjustment and recalibration. But also, and maybe especially, I trust that there is something here for me, for you, for all of us, because this series is situated in a season of Christian timekeeping known as Epiphany. And you may not know much about this. This is just a season that, as one commentator writes, it invites us to consider how Christ's divinity shines from his humanity, revealing a scope to salvation that's often wider than we imagined. See, each year on the heels of Christmas, the season of Epiphany comes along and it invites me, it invites you to assume a posture of ascent, To consider how in Jesus' divine love let go a measure of its power and its security to pick up and put on humanity. To consider how in the stories that we have about Jesus, as the gospel unfolds, we see renewal and regeneration spring up simply in the splashing of river water and in the wine of a wedding feast. Right there in the simple shimmering moments of a human life. And it invites us to consider, to imagine, to believe even that this still happens. And to be ready to say yes when it does. And with this in mind, I want to read the lectionary gospel selection for this second Sunday of Epiphany. It's a short episode from the Gospel of John. We read at the end of chapter one that the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And he finds Philip. He says to Philip, follow me. Now, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, who we met earlier in the chapter, if you want to go and read, they're from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip goes and he finds Nathanael, this other guy, and he tells him, we've found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Nathaniel replies, he says, can anything good come from there? And Philip says simply, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. 
How do you know me, sir? Says Nathanael. And Jesus answers him and says, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree there before Philip called you. And then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, the long awaited one. And Jesus responds and says, you believe because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree. You're going to see greater things than that. And there's a lot of curious things going on here. The beginning of John's gospel, this chapter one, it grabs a lot of headlines for theologians and commentators, understandably, because at the beginning, it's got this poetry and praise for the word there in the beginning that has now become flesh among us. But for me personally, the past couple of years, I've actually been drawn to the end of John chapter one, to these epiphany texts about how Jesus' earthly ministry actually started up. And this is no exception, this story here. There are so many fun details embedded in the narrative. You've got Jesus, he's far from home. He's down in the south along the Jordan River by Jerusalem. And then in the verses that precede this, we see that some of John the Baptist's crew, they have been tracking with Jesus. They follow him, actually. It's kind of creepy. And then we see, as I read to you, that Jesus is finding these recruits. We hear some shade thrown at Jesus' hometown. And we observe a revealing of Jesus' mysterious divine knowledge and understanding and awareness. And in response to that, we see Nathaniel confirm Jesus as God and King. Then we watch as Jesus seems to almost look into the camera with an eyebrow up like Dr. Smolder Bravestone. And he says, in effect, you thought that was amazing? You haven't seen anything yet. Which isn't to say that I think that Jesus looked like Dwayne the Rock Johnson in Jumanji so much as I think that it's helpful to imagine in the Gospels, Jesus looking at the camera and breaking the fourth wall. Anyway, back to the story and to this part about these followers finding Jesus and Jesus finding followers. See, it's important in the mix of all that to acknowledge that there was a lot of unease and disorientation as the background to this searching and finding being done by first century characters. Not unlike our own world, there was plenty of political and social tension. There was lots of economic pressure and uncertainty. And in that climate, some of these people walking around, no doubt had had enough of the religious powers and personalities of their time. Some of them are likely in full on deconstruction mode. And this is why they flocked to hear John the Baptist. This is why now they are turning because they are intrigued by Jesus. Perhaps they're eager to find a version of faith that was rooted in integrity and in justice. Maybe they were just looking for something real and embodied. Perhaps they wanted some alignment between a faith they could feel changing in themselves and also this sense, this new sense of who they were becoming. They wanted to feel those things coming together. And I think that that can feel familiar for some of us too. That sense that we have to actually let go of ideas that once felt safe. That sense that maybe, just maybe, the story of Jesus might hold something that we need. And this is why. I love how John presents Jesus appearing in the world, how his arrival actually played out because I think it mirrors our experience. I think it hints too at what the future holds for us. Because maybe your journey of faith isn't, or maybe it is a lot like the disciples here. It's like a scavenger hunt because you've gone out looking where out of curiosity or out of necessity, you have set out searching for something that you can't, you can't quite put your finger on. You can just feel it. Or perhaps you've promised yourself that you will not return to what you've known, even though not returning has left you lonely. Or conversely, maybe your journey of faith feels a little bit like Philip's here, like a game of hide and seek that you didn't know you were playing, right? Where newness and this trust for whoever and whatever God might be, this new perspective, it feels like it just keeps finding you even when you're not looking for it. 
And what this story offers is a picture of how wherever you are in your relationship to faith, you can pick up wherever you left off. 2024 is here offering you another opportunity to search for a faith worth finding and another chance to be surprised by a faith worth being found by. Now, let's jump back to a couple points of interest in the text here. The first is right off the top. The NIV, which I read to you, it says this, that Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And what's interesting is that the verb here, translated as decided, it's just the Greek word thelo. It's a verb that implies a little more than Jesus getting up that day. He sees there's a great forecast. He packs a picnic basket, puts on a quick bag, decides to set out on a whim. No, the verb has more weight than that. It means to wish or to desire or to exercise the will. And saying that he decided to leave, it certainly works in English, but I think it could actually just as easily be read that that day, Jesus determined to leave. You see, we don't know all the circumstances, but we do know that at some point, having had this ecstatic baptism experience and having some people come along and affirm his message, having maybe renegotiated his relationship with his cousin John and realizing the ways that they were different, realizing that the hubbub of Jerusalem wasn't really for him, he realized that he needed to chart his own course. And so Jesus determined then that it was time to head north toward home. And I love what this choice reveals about the overarching theme of divine action in scripture and in the world. That for all the power that created and sustains the universe, that for all the mystery of how spirit breathes and restores and makes new, Jesus shows us that divine intent and creativity and redemption itself, how these things emerged in the fallout of his human choices. In this text and in the rest of the gospel story, we see a picture of God in Christ discerning direction and figuring things out on the fly and discovering a way forward at times. And that might not seem like a big deal, but a robust theology of Christ and of Christ's humanity requires that we read the stories of his decisions as a frame for our own decisions. How Jesus, like you and me, had to find out and work out and flesh out the mystery of a life, picking up and moving on from who and where he'd been. And that, in some small measure, is what Epiphany and this series and what remains of 2024 ahead of us, they invite us to consider these things. They invite us to consider that moving on isn't optional, right? Like your relationships will shift whether you determine to change them or not. And your body will change, I promise you. And your intentions and your motivations, they are going to transform whether you are paying attention to them or not. And other peoples are doing the same all around you. We never remain as or where we were. Jesus shows us that in the story. And I think it's worth remembering that in all of your picking up, your determination can have redemptive outcomes too. But I also think it's so important to notice how Jesus approached this moving on moment. See, the text tells us that Jesus finds Philip invites him to follow. And then we're told what feels like this uninteresting, unimportant, unrelated personal information. Verse 44 says that Philip, like these two brothers who have discovered Jesus right before this story, that Philip was from the town of Bethsaida. And then Philip goes and finds this guy named Nathaniel. Nathaniel comes to discover the hype that Jesus is. Is it for real? Then he has this mysterious encounter where he, see, he feels seen, he feels known. And then he has a conversation with this person where he sees and knows the divine in a new way. And then he's brought into this little group that's going to leave the next day. And you might be wondering why any of that matters. Unlike every social studies class you ever took, the answer 
is in the geography. Here's a map. It's a map of where Jesus' ministry unfolds, almost all of it. The story we're in today actually happens below this map, about 100 kilometers to the south. So here you've got Nazareth. You can see it there, Jesus' hometown. That's where he was from, up in the mountains. And there is also the Sea of Galilee, where so many stories in the Gospels happen. And if you look, you can see Bethsaida on the north side of the sea. John tells us that Andrew and Peter and Philip, who we've just met, that they're from this town. The scholars generally speculate that these people probably all knew each other. And if you keep looking, you can see this town called Cana. It's there to the west of the sea. That's the town that's going to pop up in the next chapter after these guys have gone north together. And we're going to see Jesus take a wedding reception to the next level there. This is a town that a little later in John, we will learn that Nathaniel, who we've just met, is from there. Which just means that if we read this text carefully, we see how Jesus' decision to move on shapes the unfolding redemptive story of scripture. And we see how Jesus appears to be surrounding himself with people for the place that he intends to go. Look, we don't know why Jesus chose the followers he did. Did he choose Matthew, the tax collector, because he needed a CFO? Maybe. Did he choose Peter, who was impulsive and confrontational because he knew he was going to need an honest critic in his life? Did he choose Philip and Nathaniel in this story because they were intimate with the neighborhoods and communities that he knew he'd probably end up in? Or maybe Jesus just wanted some friends. Whatever it was, it offers you the assurance that it's okay to determine in your heart and mind where you need to go in all of your moving on this year. And that you are right to discern and choose carefully and strategically who you need to take with you. Now that can sound like a bit of a cliche and I don't offer it as that. I think most of us know That deciding where to go in our spiritual and in our emotional and in our professional transformation, this can be so hard. We likely have all had the experience where picking up newness, it's tricky because we can't can't determine what's best. Or how there are these times when it feels like all we're doing is picking up. We're often left picking up the pieces of what and who and where we thought we'd be. And with all the sincerity I can muster today, I want to assure you, there's no rush. If you feel like your hands and your heart and your schedule are full, trust me, it won't always be that way. And if you feel like there are too many options and pathways and potentials and pursuits, trust me, take your time being wise with them. Wherever you find yourself today, there's less an imperative to pick up the right thing and to pick up and get to the right place or to pick up the right relationship or the right resource that's finally going to break you free from where you felt stuck. No, there's more an encouragement here to take a posture of assent to the epiphanies of who God is and who you are And what the world is meant to look like, the epiphanies that are all around us. And you might be asking, well, where where do we find these? And to be honest, I can't be sure where you'll find them. And I've actually been pretty deliberate today in not trying to define it for you. But one thing I'm trying to pay attention to this year is the places where hope no matter how fleeting, how hope leads me in my search for epiphany. A few weeks ago, I stumbled across a poem by Rosemary Watola Tromer, in which she writes, hope has holes in its pockets. It leaves little crumb trails so that we, when anxious, can follow it. 
And those words got me thinking about how the right way forward for me on team no, how it's so often found in saying yes to life. Even when, even when life confounds me, and even when it's heavy, and even when it surprises me with what I don't want to see, and how the way ahead is often found in paying attention, no matter how difficult to my fragile hope. Those places in my life where hope keeps popping up. And sometimes it does that with determination, like Jesus in the story, determination to head out, to do what I think you know is best, right? And sometimes it appears in the unexpected, like it does for Nathaniel in the story, where light and life emerge from places or people or events that I may not have seen for what they are. And what's striking about this is that this isn't just something that we practice as individual people here today. It's actually something that we do together as community too. See, this is our 10th year together as a church in the city of Calgary. And we've been hopeful and we've picked up some things for this year. We've brought on new local partnerships, We've experimented with our 7 p.m. service, which we love. We've committed to continue shaping creative and thoughtful curriculum for Commons kids. We've got new courses on themes like masculinity and parenting coming this spring. Those are new. And next month, we're saying yes to this persistent hope we have of being a local embodied community by running a short-term pop-up down in the south of Calgary. We know that so many people in our city are looking for connections, so we're going to try something. We're going to come together for four consecutive Thursday nights in a different neighborhood than West Hillhurst. We're going to share a meal. We'll make some space for anyone searching for honest, passionate conversation about who Jesus is. And maybe that's you. Maybe that's someone listening online or on our podcast. Maybe it's someone that you know. Maybe this is a moment where we can learn together what commons is becoming. And if that sparks your imagination, you can find more info on our website and upcoming events. We'd love to have you at that table. That said, I really wish that we could go around the room and name the bold and the hesitant, the audacious and the tender hopes that are held here today. And as we close, Maybe I can encourage you to let this be the year that you put that long-held career aspiration, you kick it into motion. Or to let this season where you, let it be the one where you find the therapist and the help that you know you need. Maybe to let this be the moment where you choose to read some more scripture or to write some more poetry or to cover more kilometers or to just give more hugs or more gifts, or more of your attention. To let this be the year where you prioritize those you love most. And here's another idea. What if we all decided to reach out to that person that we see, or we know, or we've met, maybe here, maybe out there, and you all know who I'm talking about. It's that person that you've heard, or you've seen, or you've met, and you thought to yourself, I wonder how they're doing. I wonder if they'd be open to friendship. Can you spot the breadcrumbs in that? The breadcrumbs of hope? And don't for a second let that be the end of the list. No, no, no. Go home, take your journal, take whatever you write in, and make some notes of the intuition that sprung up even in these few moments. Knowing that my prayer is that you would be honest and wise and tenacious with your limited time as you choose to pick up the new and in so doing that you would follow the trail that hope always leaves a path that follows God's good and patient and faithful work in you all the way home to where grace is always waiting Hey, Jeremy here, and thank you for clicking through to watch that video. If you're intrigued by the work that we're doing here at Commons, you can, of course, hit subscribe to keep up to date with all of the content that we're posting here on YouTube. You can head to our website at commons.church, and you can find us on all of the socials at Commons Church. 
You can also join our Discord. Uh, there, the community is having all kinds of conversations about how we can encourage each other in the way of Jesus. Head to commons.church slash discord for the invite there. Also, leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you and all the ways that you are journeying on this path toward Jesus. But thanks for tuning in. Thanks for all the ways that you contribute to this conversation together. We'll see you soon.